Okay, let's get started. So it's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today. It's Alina Vdovina from Newcastle University, and she is going to tell us something about buildings, quaternions, and the Dreamfield Manion solutions of, of young Baxter equations. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, speak in New York. And uh, today I'm going to talk about like connections between mathematics and physics. And uh, um, so what, what I would like to say that um, usually to be useful in theoretical physics, mathematical structure has to be scientifically rich and um, cover several fields of mathematics, physics, probably computer science. But there is a barrier and one of the barriers, it's like there are different languages and different terminologies. So it's always very difficult to make it precise. And uh, I'm going to remind the geometric core, which uh, I was um, talking about many times, but uh, uh, anyway, I will, I will remind some definitions. And uh, here the example, it's uh, so-called uh, Young Baxter equations, which um, appear quite a lot in uh, various area of uh, uh, like physics and uh, differential equations. But um, uh, what, what I did actually, I went quite uh, far like into the history to going to basics and um, looking at the original papers of uh, Drinfeld and Manin, because uh, uh, now it's uh, this ki kind of um, uh, subject is quite well developed. But uh, um, for me, it was interesting. Where, where does it come from, like from the very beginning? And what I, what I have found that it's not just kind of one solution, but it's like a large family, like almost a philosophy. And, uh, after like original works of uh, Drinfeld and Manin, uh, were like many follow up several um, community, but it's all mainly like algebra and uh, uh, like category theory. So it's not that many geometric applications. There were, there, there are some um, like not invariants uh, related to this, but uh, what I'm going to talk about, it's um, quite like much more, much more general. And the plan is like, I start from, from the definitions, uh, but then I will remind the uh, like build, uh, definitions of buildings and arithmetic cube complexes. And uh, then at the end I show, I will show how it's connected, but like with very, with very precise, precise examples. So let's start from the definition and I'm going to spend some time um, on some time on it and please do ask me questions if it's not completely clear because this first slide is going to be like, um, it's supposed to be almost obvious. So first of all, uh, what is this? So we, we just look at some non-empty set X and we look at the bijection from X square to X square given by some rules like um, r of x, y equal uh, uv. And uh, we call r a set theoretical solution of Jan Baxter or Drinfeldmannian solution if indeed this kind of uh, Jan Baxter equation is satisfied on uh, x to the power three. So rj, uh, rj means acting on i's and j's component of R3. So actually this is um, indeed like people call it a uh, set theoretic solution but of the Young Baxter equation, but why I wanted to like have some other words, like I said that it's like Drenfeld Manin solution because for a set theoretic solution, uh, people uh, usually introduce some more uh, kind of constraints and in my opinion, some of those, um, because of those constraints, one loses some kind of interesting solutions in interesting um, uh, geometry. So this is in a way, the most um, general set, set, set theoretical solution, which one can imagine. And uh, 
indeed i will uh, i will show how uh one can get um, such solutions from uh from like uh, concrete uh, cube complexes and in particular arithmetic cube complexes so okay any any questions about this definition because i really want everybody to be to be on board is it a kind of a braid relation ah so you see lisa very very good question that indeed it's a braid relation but it's not a group right it's uh, uh, indeed that very often people in the representation theory and in physics they kind of jump to the braid group but as we know groups can be quite restrictive right even to be a group you already impose um, a lot of constraints and what i've realized that but also um, I already mentioned that I gave a talk in Max Planck, like I was talking to uh, to um, Yuri Ivanovich Manin, uh, that actually when they, um, and I looked at all papers like on of uh, Drinfeld, uh, there was no, they didn't have any additional constraint when they talked about those Jan Baxter equations. So that's why it's kind of, I, I don't say that I already know everything about the subject, it's just kind of, at the beginning, but uh, we can see that if you don't have like additional constraints, then you get many, many more solutions. It's just kind of uh, interesting what one can do with them. Yeah, but very good. But yeah. Uh -huh. One one question. Um, so yeah. this this uh, product. So R two three is it? Uh, so is it a composition or it is a product of results? Uh, it's a composition. So we have a composition of R12, R23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. R... Mm -hmm. Because you see, this is on R3. So this is going uh, to be like uh, this, this composition. So when we apply this, so we apply this to x squared. Yeah, yeah, and to x because it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there are triples, right? It's like mm -hmm. triples. Mm -hmm. Whatever, like so, x, okay, y. So we apply this composition to triple, and so we have a triple, and yeah. the right we also, okay, so and this is, I understand. So, so indeed, it's like it's functions. Really so it's every quality function. of them as functions, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But okay. it's, it's like here there is a triple, and here there is a triple on each on each side, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. and, and this rule, the rule goes from x squared to x squared, right? But the equation is for triples. Mm -hmm. okay. But actually, it's okay. again like a, uh, good, uh, good question because one can um, generalize it. There are so-called like knizhnik zovmolotik of equations where you have like triple tensors and quadruples and so on. But I just want to stay with this one just to kind of give a flavor of the subject. But if you're interested, I, I, I would be very happy to discuss um, further. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you for asking. But now I just um, tell you that. Um, how it's related to kind of uh, classical and Baxter equations because what I gave on the previous side it's, uh, it's theoretical but usually people like in physics they are interested like in linear operators going saying from tensor products of vectors of vector spaces and it can be like a vector spaces they so physicists usually like vector spaces on over uh, complex numbers but actually it doesn't matter right which uh, what would be the ground field but uh, uh, if if you have like general uh, vector space and you have like tensor products, then it's usually harder to solve. But what um, uh, if we do have like um, the set theoretical uh, solution, then we get a lot of uh, solutions because um, with our set X, we can just span uh, the um, basis vectors of our uh, of our vector space and then we get solutions of of this uh, classical young baxter equation okay for the moment we can uh, talk about like finite dimensional spaces but it wouldn't be a problem to do this to 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 generalize to infinite dimensional spaces but it's still again like physicists are always uh, uh, very interested interested still like in finite dimensional spaces in this in this context so yeah it's kind of a it was i i think it belongs to Drin, drinfield and uh, to manin that they had this kind of ingenious idea that you can span 
the basis vectors of um, uh, vector space by by those elements uh, which um, come from the space um, uh, from from the set X. Okay. So this is like about this connection with physics, and now again I will talk about buildings. But in the end, I will explain how exactly do we get uh, this uh, kind of Drinfeld Manning solutions from uh, from cube complexes, and uh, so. Of course, you've seen those definitions many times, but what, what I would like to remind, right, how I think about um, complexes and uh, uh, in particular about buildings that um, I always uh, think about some kind of a finite, a finite object, but then uh, like I think about buildings as universal covers of, um, of those finite objects. And of course, this example is trivial, but uh, of course, like, uh, on, on the place of a wedge of circles, uh, we want to have like first, I, I will remind first two dimensional complexes, but then I will talk about three dimensional complexes and, and uh, further, but of course, like it's difficult to give uh, explicit examples in dimensions four and uh, four and higher. Okay, so yeah, it's like uh, two, di two dimensional, like if you, so in the previous example, it's just a reminder, right? That what are the uh, apartments? The apartments here are just lines going from one point in infinity to another. And um, like uh, ch chambers are uh, just edges. But then if you go to the uh, dimension two, even the uh, apartments already become planes, either hyperbolic planes or Euclidean planes tessellated by polygons, but of course it's already hard to uh, draw even um, uh, two-dimensional buildings. But let's give, because of course we have um, like specialists in the audience and um, I think by, by now I was, I gave definition of this kind of geometric building so many times that I think I already have everybody on board. But to remind it again that uh, we say that an n-dimensional Euclidean or hyperbolic building is n-dimensional complex X, such that X is a union of uh, tessellated n-dimensional places, which we call apartments. And um, then for any two chambers, there is an apartment uh, containing both of them. And actually the chambers are usually the tiles of our tessellations. And if two apartments uh, have non-trivial intersection, then there is an isomorphism of the apartment fixing their uh, intersection point-wise, right? But of course, it's like there are other definitions of a build, building, but uh, what I'm always interested like in uh, Euclidean or hyperbolic buildings. So in a way we have some kind of uh, uh, geometry, geometry behind. And uh, now let's remind, what is what is the polyhedron? Yeah, how it's usually how we think about um, about it in geometric group theory. We take um, uh, some set of uh, polygons and we uh, write some labeling schemes on the boundary, and then we identify sides with the same labels respecting orientation. And for for this for, for my uh, for, for my applications today, I, I will be interested in mainly in cube complexes. So, like in dimension two, it's um, square complexes. So here, like most of the buildings uh, today, will be actually geometrically products of trees. And of course, like a Cartesian product of even n trees, it's not such a complicated object. But uh, when we are interested in, in groups acting on, on, on those um, um, like Cartesian products of trees, then we have a lot of um, interesting examples. And like dimension two was mainly studied by uh, Weiss and Burger Moses and um, uh, their students. But what, um, um, what I've done re relatively recent about um, a couple of years ago, it's like to, uh, explain how to uh, build complexes in dimensions three and higher and 
say, saying with arithmetic fundamental groups or even like with non residually uh, finite fundamental groups. I'm, I mentioned it in my one of my talks in New York, but it's just kind of a uh, reminder. But again, like today, I want to show how to get this set theoretical solutions of Jan Barkster equations uh, using this uh, cube complexes. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so then uh, let's remind also the definition of a link, right? It's a sphere of a small radius uh, uh, with a, at the point of, of the polyhedron is kind of centered uh, at the point of a polyhedron. And then the intersection of the sphere with the polyhedron is a graph and we call, call this link. So we can think about it as a kind of part of a, a polyhedron. So imagine like in this, uh, in this vertex here, we have a sphere, kind of uh, this bl black sphere and uh, this sphere intersects uh, our polyhedron. So the link here is just this white, uh, black vertex and uh, four black, black edges. But of course, like we, when we have many squares meeting at one point, the link is going to be more uh, complicated. And then we are interested in thick polyhedra. So it means that each edge belongs at least to at least three, three polygons. And um, here, like in this example with four squares, uh, the link is, um, uh, complete uh, complete bipartite graph four four right so if we come back if we take all the four squares here then if we glue everything together we get just one vertex and um, uh, the link is this, uh, this vertex is going to be this complete bipartite graph four four and again this graph has um, uh, diameter two and girth four. So, and again, like uh, I like to cite this um, uh, theorem because it um, gives us immediately uh, e explicit examples of buildings, right? Because if we uh, look at the universal cover of any polyhedron with kind of nice links, uh, then the universal cover, it's a two dimensional building. And uh, actually I did generalize this uh, for any dimensions as well, if somehow we get a finite complex with nice links, then the universal uh, cover is a building. But then also I remind, I many times um, I explain it, but just I kind of uh, remind this, uh, first of all, like two dimensional polygonal presentation that uh, um, uh, we uh, kind, kind of, uh, over, over the years, I already developed um, many methods how to get such sets of words that you, if you take those words, you write them on the boundary of the disks, and then when you uh, pull it um, on together, then you get a kind of nice, um, nice link. But again, you don't need to uh, to have like necessarily buildings. It can be. Uh, it can be something else, and in general, you can, uh, in fact, you can realize every. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Alina, could, could you show the condition again from the previous slide? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, so, so it's you see, it's good to to remind because I thought, okay, like I give my standard uh, set of definitions, but it's um, uh, actually good to remind. So if all. Only, of, of course, like in, it's not uh, formulated in this way in, in Balman and Brin, but uh, Balman saw this formulation and he, he kind of never, uh, ne never denies it because it's somehow in their paper, it's formulated in such a horrible way that nobody understands it. Uh, but uh, it's not not nobody, but it's kind of a very dynamic dy dynamical system. So, so but you're talking yeah. about vertex links here, right? Yeah, 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 vertex links, of course, it's vertex. Yeah. And M here is uh, any M, M, an M, 
Uh, yeah, very good. It's diameter, right? So maybe no, I was uh, too, too fast because sorry, I mean, actually it's good that you stopped me because I thought that I I gave those definitions so many times that people can be bored. But actually, it's good uh, good to remind it. So no, it's, uh, that's not, not what I meant. I, any restrictions on M, like M? Is yeah, yeah, big, yeah. Or? Of course, there is a uh, there is a, a restriction on M because it's um, uh, a fate in Higman uh, of I think it's something like sixty eight. Uh, very classical result of fate in Higman that if you want um, uh, the graph to be uh, finite, then M is two, three, four, six, and eight. I see. Okay. Very and good. for yeah. six and eight, actually, it's not uniform. So if you want it to be uniform, it's always two, three, or four. And actually, also on this seminar, I was talking about four, but actually, if it's four, it's uh, those examples which I was doing with um, Rika Kangaslampi, and then to, together with, with Lisa Carboni, we also have like uh, uh, a lot of examples for, but it's hyper hyperbolic groups with, um, with M equal to four. And then with three, I also had a lot of examples, and it's also so called like Cartwright Stiger uh, groups, but actually, M equal to two, it's what I'm talking now about that saying just geometry is not too hard because it's a product of trees, but apparently you can get a lot of kind of interesting arithmetic there, which is, yeah, one can think about also uh, as a generalization of uh, a book uh, of Ser in kind of several, in two directions. Actually with Olga, we have a, we, we have a survey in the uh, group, um, in this kind of hand, handbook of, of group actions, like we have a survey which is called like generalization of trees in uh, uh, two, two directions. So one can look at the kind of um, basic um, uh, facts about trees and, um, and our trees and, and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Very good, uh, very good um, uh, okay, questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's you. You don't need to uh, kind of, of course uh, to 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 read the, uh, this definition, but it's just kind of to make a point that it's still not not that hard, right? That we can have like some disjoint bipartite graphs, but then there are certain uh, combinatorial conditions on words which allow us to to get the links we we need. Um, yeah, so. And again, like the, even there are some rather elementary constructions from uh, 20 years ago that actually any graphs can be realized as, um, uh, as links. But now I would like to remind a bit of uh, like number, number theory because it's actually, we want to have some extra structure on those complexes uh, covered by products of uh, of trees, and um, uh, let's uh, look at the products of um, squares. And uh, so there is like Jacobi uh, four square theorem, which I like to give as a kind of project um, uh, for for students. So the number of ways to represent n as a sum of four squares. It's eight times the sum of, of, of the divisors of n if n is odd, right? So this is just exactly the same. So if you say that we have some four tuple uh, such that uh, the sum of the squares is p, then there's, this number is eight uh, multiplied by p, p plus one, okay? And, but suppose if you say that uh, this is kind of additional restriction, which we don't really need, but it, this is kind of uh, what, what I'm uh, leading to. I'm leading to kind of classical examples of uh, Margulis and uh, uh, Lubotsky, Philip Sarnak, and it's kind of a, a nice, um, uh, nice computations in this case. So it just kind of to give a flavor how quaternions uh, first uh, appeared in the, in this kind of business of group actions and uh, graphs and so on. So it's a, in, in, a, in some sense, it's a detour because to get 
uh, the solutions of uh, Jan Baxter equations, I need complexes of kind of interesting solutions. I need complexes of the dimension at least three. But uh, this kind of explains it uh, somehow the flavor of, of the arithmetic behind. So uh, let's look at the, if, if one of our uh, AJs is odd, then it's um, already P, P plus one. And um, uh, what is the consequence that if we look at the quaternions, right? So the kind of a reminder, what are the quaternions? Uh, that uh, um, so the norm right um, uh, um, square of the norm is p, but it's you see it's uh, it's straightforward right because what are those uh, a naught a one a two a three it's like we we had it on the previous slide that um, uh, there's uh, square the sum of the squares is p and it's exactly square of the norm right because the norm of a quaternion it's a square root uh, of them some some of the squares. Right, so this set uh, is, yeah, I, I don't know, like, I think that I change it already, but it's again, by, by some reason, there is a misprint. So this is, of course, the size of, um, uh, of the set is P is P plus one. Okay, any, any questions? Okay, this is, of course, kind of elementary number theory. Mm. Okay, so uh, this is this kind of uh, one dimensional case of arithmetic uh, groups acting on, on, just, uh, on just one one tree, right? So it's like I had this um, uh, tree in the beginning of the, uh, of the talk and we can introduce somehow arithmetic into the free group because actually those P, P plus one um, elements which are defined by this uh, uh, by this map uh, with, with, with this rule, right? Again, we have those A0, A1, A2, uh, A3. Uh, then uh, we can get uh, the images of, uh, of the quaternions. And those um, images um, actually generate a free group of rank P plus one divided by two and uh, this uh, group, uh, this free group acts transitively on vertices of a P plus one regular tree. But of course, it's um, somehow quite clear from the point of view of geometric group theory that the free, the free group always acts on, a, uh, on its Kelly graph, but it's just here we have this um, additional interpretation in, in the lang language of arithmetic. But then uh, of course, this is just a small remark about, I will not talk to about Ramanujan graph or Ramanujan complexes, but if you're interested, you can ask me later. I kind of, I can explain and give all the uh, relevant references. But then what about um, products of trees, right? If you want to get like arithmetic group acting on product of trees, and uh, the way, as I already mentioned, the results of Berger and Moses and uh, and uh, Ratagi, who was a former student of um, uh, Mark Berger, um, so they, there were uh, a lot of examples, but acting on product of trees of different valences. And uh, uh, actually it turned out quite hard to get arithmetic groups acting on uh, product of trees of, of the same valency, which we started like 2003 with Jakob Stiggs, but later, uh, also involving some other people, we had like uh, also three, three and higher uh, di dimensional examples of arithmetic groups. And uh, what um, this kind of, uh, to, to have the same valences of trees, it's also nice because we get uh, like Ramanujan complexes, which are complexes with kind of optimal uh, spectral properties. But again, it's a bit technical. I just want to give some flavors, what is different for products of the same valency, uh, that apparently Hamiltonian quaternions don't work uh, for the uh, trees of the same valency. We have to move to more general quaternionic algebras. 
and in a way to introduce some transcendental parameter. And um, uh, so, um, again, the general construction is um, quite uh, involved, but uh, to just to give a flavor, I can uh, talk about this example uh, covered by product of two trees of valency four, uh, that, um, and uh, saying P, P equal to three, uh, just uh, to indeed just to give an idea that uh, uh, to uh, that uh, the relations depend on certain quaternions. Actually, here, if, if uh, you plug in all those kind of quaternionic expressions into the relations, one one everything kind of cancels in the magical in a magical way. But Again, there is some mathematics behind it uh, uh, as well. So it's a two-dimensional, yeah. So it's in a way how it's how it's related uh, to buildings that uh, uh, we can think about the product of two trees as a uh, as a building where, like all planes, are tessellated by squares and um, uh, saying four four triangles meet at each edge, like in my examples, which which I showed earlier, but then uh, also the link at every vertex for, for, this, for this example is a bipartite graph on eight vertices, but moreover like this G is arithmetic lattice in, in, in this group, but so as I already mentioned, we have like uh, instead of three, we can have any, um, uh, any prime power, but then also to have any number of uh, PGL um, F three and what does it mean kind of arithmetic lattice that you you even can have like the very explicit uh, matrices to uh, very explicit faithful representations of your group which also has some kind of nice uh, properties but i don't know yet how to really use it for them for the young baxter equations but i think there is some kind of um, possible application. So as I already mentioned, uh, we have like those ex series of explicit quaternionic groups acting on products of trees, but also uh, with, with those kind of arithmetic methods, you can also uh, ensure that if, even in uh, for, for the product of exactly the same trees, you can have non-commensurable classes of groups and even uh, you can estimate some like number of those non-commensurable lattices. Okay, so now let's give an example for um, Q equal to, uh, for 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 dimension three. And again, we have some um, kind of quaternionic expressions. And actually, uh, yes. Yeah, so again, like it's very similar that you can get them uh, those. Um, A's, B's, and C's, you can get them into relations. And you see, this is one of the smallest examples uh, of a group acting on a, a product, a Cartesian product of three trees. And how you can think about it, that um, if you think uh, fix A and B, then it gives you a two-dimensional example. It gives you a, uh, an example of a group acting on a product of uh, uh, two trees. And then if you fix A and C, it's also two trees. And C and B, it's also act acting on the product of uh, two trees. But then all together, they act on the product of three trees. So here, somehow, one can explain why um, it took such a long time, right? So those examples of um, uh, Danny Weiss and Burger and Mozek, they, they were known already like in uh, mid, uh, like late 80s, early 2000. But for the, uh, for those three, three dimensional examples, we got with, uh, with Jakob Sticks um, and his students relatively, relatively recent because it's somehow counterintuitive that uh, uh, Group acting on the product of, of a of like three three and more trees uh, is a blend of uh, several two dimensional groups. So, for example, here, like uh, this kind of three dimensional group is a blend of 
three two dimensional. Um, okay, so yeah, and now finally I can get back to Jan Baxter's right uh, that. So this is ge geometric realization of uh, this uh, 357 example, uh, which I had on the previous slide. So 3, 5, and 7, it's like different um, uh, prime, prime numbers. And um, so those relations actually, which, which we have here, one can put on the sides of uh, 20, 24 cubes. But this is just one of those cubes. And so how do we get back to Jan Baxter? So do remember we had the set X and the set, uh, the set X is taken to be the set of, of the labels of the edges of the cubes and the inverses, right? So, so for example, we have one A1, but A1 inverse, it's another, element of, of the set X. And then uh, what is the rule to uh, kind of build this um, uh, R, uh, like in, in, uh, in the theory Jan Baxter, of the Jan Baxter equations, people call it like R matrices. So if you have a geometric square, right? Saying if you have a geometric square in the complex, uh, x i x j x k is l as the label of a square then we say that r of uh, x i x j equals to a l inverse a k inverse right so for example in this um, uh, example we have uh, uh, the set x with 18 elements and actually the R matrix is going to be of the size 3, 324 and 324, right? Because we have to show uh, the, uh, the, R, um, the R matrix, it's um, the, the bijection between pairs, right? So, but again, how we see it on the four, on the, on the square, right? For example, here we have A1, B1 and then B1, B2 inverse A2. So if we, so saying, let's write it, we have R of A1, B1 equals uh, B2 inverse. Um, A2. Okay, but of course, like each uh, geometric square uh, induces several, induces four kind of such relations, A at least four, right? Because we, if you want to have like R from mm, B1, A2 inverse, then it would be uh, A1 inverse. Uh, B2 inverse and uh, so on. So let's erase this. So any questions about, uh, about this definition of the R map? Is, is that the same as what they call the R matri matrix in the um, Yang-Baxter equation? Yeah, actually, it is the it is the R matrix indeed. Oh, it sorry, the, it's on it's on the bottom of your slide. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, it's a R matrix of size, but it's like for the uh, for uh, for this um, kind of set theoretical Drenfeld Manning, but it's like I, I explained it in the in the beginning of my talk. Indeed, indeed, it's a it's a R, R matrix. But again, yeah. like there is a, it's just one example, but of course we have like this machinery to get cube complexes and from each complex you do, you get an um, matrix. But actually it's uh, saying for people with the background on geometric group theory, it's not even that complicated to show that indeed uh, this um, uh, Jan Baxter equation is satisfied and uh, what is the trick? Uh, 
actually, so for example, here, like a, a, a one, a B1, C2. So if you take like three elements from different alphabets, you always have a cube such that this kind of path of length three goes from, from one corner to the opposite corner of the cube. Right, so you somehow use that your, okay, it was a group, but in a way we just use those A, Bs and Cs only as kind of labels, kind of abstract labels, uh, elements of abstract set. And then what we do, right? We, we look uh, at this um, uh, Jan Baxter and here we say R1, R2. So we take A1, B1, but then with this rule, right, it's uh, uh, R of A1, B1, we take the geometric square, we get B2 inverse A2, right? Then we look at the uh, R2, 3, right? So we have here A2, C2. So we, we look here, A2, C2. So what is the image? It's uh, uh, C3 inverse, A1 inverse. And then the last one, it's one, two. So we get B2 inverse, um, so where is some, um... ah, yes, yeah, so it's, it's correct, right? So we get, um, a3, E3 inverse, A1 inverse, and then we get B2 inverse. Oh. Okay, maybe I had to, it can be the, of course, it's like always hard. It can be that it's a misprint, but we have to get to them. No, it's not even misprint, right? It's like, yeah, it's it's correct. It's B B2, B2 inverse C3, right? B2 C3, and we get uh, to C4 B2 inverse. Actually, it's all correct, right? We get C2 B2 inverse A1 inverse. Of course, it's kind of to make everything live, right? It's a bit time consuming, but I think in this way, one kind of uh, gets satisfaction that it really works, right? So in a way that uh, you get, so if you go this this way, right, you get um, uh, you get the, uh, this, uh, the sides of the cube. So this, this side, this side, and this side, right? But then when you, uh, go when you look at this Jan Baxter this way when you have two r uh, two three one two two three then you go like the opposite um, uh, opposite square so you first start with now uh, okay we will not go through everything but we can just start like here uh, r uh, two three so it's b one c two uh, so b one c two it's uh, C1, B1 inverse. And then if we go like, uh, if we apply all three, we get exactly the same like C, C4, uh, uh, B2 inverse, A, A1 inverse. So in a way, uh, this kind of both of those operators, even so that you get uh, different intermediate answers, if you have a pass from one vertex of the cube to the other, uh, then you get um, uh, the kind of opposite pass, right? So in a way that's uh, this um, uh, C2, C4, it's the, on the diagonal from, uh, from C2, then, uh, then B2 is on the diagonal from B1, and A1 also, A1 inverse is on the diagonal from A1, right? So it's kind of, you, you get, uh, you get, um, uh, the solution that you, you get the proof that it's a solution just from the from the geometry of the complex but moreover the question it's like um actually lisa asked very good question about how do you know that it's exactly the same 
are metrics what what people mean right and how you uh, somehow show that saying you why, why you know that your solutions are different from what people were looking at it before uh, but uh, it turns out that this group which i was talking about it's also new invariant for for those young baxter solutions because uh, people in this area look at something which is called structure groups uh, um, but but those structure groups they are also not complete invariant for the solutions you can actually come up with different ones having the same uh, stretched structure groups but like to indeed somehow of course it's not for uh, this group doesn't exist for each solution uh, but if it does exist uh, then then it um, shows that it's a different a different solution but of course from those solutions um, for those solutions which I constructed of course you you did start with the group so this group always uh, always exists yeah so, so you, this is mainly like everything what I wanted to say but just what I wanted to finish with various kinds of uh, uh, further further research and um, yes yeah, so thank you very much for your for your attention and please ask questions question yes um the the edges you have here are identified so is it the case that the yang baxter equation is providing sort of a braiding on the identification but you see it's not um, yeah it's interesting how to how to explain it because of course like here it's just one cube right there are many like right, even right. in this small example there are 20 24 right. cubes and uh, uh, and we have this rule right how we uh, we have this rule it's it's just this rule and uh, we forget, right, that it was like braiding, identification. We forget about everything. We just think about uh, those like a L, like alphabets, a's, b's, and c's. We just think about about them as completely abstract elements of of this set X. Mm -hmm. And then we have this rule. So and it does that it it does satisfy this uh, Jan Baxter equation. So in a way, we can say that we can build uh, uh, from from this we can build uh, representations of the braid group, right? But but in a way the uh, braid group in, in indeed it's like too too big in a way. It's not restrictive enough, right? Like from the point of view of geometric group series. Uh, braid group it's almost like free right it's like just to give the braid relation it's almost like just just to make it a little bit less free but here we kind of uh, do maximum restrictions as possible of course like what is what is hidden there it's like what i, I just didn't of course it was very tempting but i didn't go to details how exactly to get to get the complexes because uh, it's non non trivial number number theory and uh, it's it's really hard to explain it just in in like very in a short talk but uh, when we do get this uh, complex which is covered by the product of several trees we do give the we do get the solution mm -hmm. thank you I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so the first one is um, usually a symmetric space gives rise to a like a semi-Romanian symmetric space or something like that gives rise to a solution of the Yang-Baxter equation, and I'm just wondering if the Q complex plays the role of a symmetric space here. I don't know if you know yeah. about those other papers. Actually, it's a very very good idea, and it's also very interesting to compare. Maybe we should yeah. really like. Uh, I have like a mm -hmm. <laughs> I can, um, point because it would be very very interesting because indeed we can think about uh, uh, like buildings as uh, generalizations of uh, symmetric uh, spaces uh, yeah. either generalizations or restrictions of symmetric spaces but it's yeah this would be very interesting to mm -hmm. to understand but maybe even there is a connection because here like uh, of course it's like first step I just started to be interested in this but here it's uh, 
uh, you see the solution here, it's, um, uh, it's the elements of the basis, right? How to get solutions. It's like you mm -hmm. index them with those A, Bs and Cs and then how you get solutions. But maybe like in the symmetric space, you already get the full equation, right? You full, the full solution. So I definitely I don't know this level of detail, but I can I can send you some papers and um, and take yeah, a look at it. Would it. Be, just... It would be very interesting, and this is actually something which I uh, this uh, uh, those invariants uh, like if you of course you you it's not always that you can find some building behind or some cube complex behind, but you, it turns out that you do find them in unexpected places. But then it's also you can show that your solutions are different. So there is like a theory of braces and I was just looking at some kind of algebraic, algebraic structures. And then you just kind of, indeed sometimes you can plug in and look at those kind of structure groups and see that they are, they are different. No, it's a, it's a very good remark. Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, so it, I mean, it's amazing that you can find solutions from, I mean, it just seems an amazing discovery to me. Um, I'm also just wondering if it's, if it refers to the classical or the quantum Yang-Baxter equation. It, it should be the quantum one, right? Because it's so... Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the quantum, it's, yeah, very, thank you very much, uh, um, Lisa. The quantum is, uh, is easy to get from this one. Yeah, it's just kind of... Uh, flip in a way flip it's of course you you get it from but here just kind of nice uh why, why i like uh, this kind of classical one mm -hmm. because there is a very nice um, interpretation that uh, uh, you see there is this uh, um, diagonal of a cube you go from from this vertex uh, to the opposite one and then what is this pass it just you have you go from the same vertex to the same vertex, just kind of as far as possible from your first pass, right? So it's like if you, so what is this um, pass here? Like it's a, a1, b1, c2, but this pass it's uh, c4, uh, b2, a1. But if we um, want uh, like the classical uh, quantum, quantum Jan Baxter, uh, then you have it's exactly the same elements, but then you have to put them in the into the order. You so the the classical and the classical will be like a, a one inverse b two inverse c four, mm -hmm. but it's it's really just the uh, the classical and Baxter. You just um, kind of flip uh, flip the elements of u and v in 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 the R matrix. Um, the presentation uh, of the of the group you showed us looks very much like the presentations we have in our paper for groups acting on hyperbolic buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, the the idea. It's um, uh, just we had like a s s triangles, right? And it's yeah. also hyper hyperbolic. But what is what do we need? Uh, what do we need here? We need. Um, uh, to go to like if you want like genuinely saying three dimensional and higher because actually uh, this goes like to four dimensional and I just didn't uh, have like because uh, saying four dimensional example it's uh, it's really quite quite huge but to have um, uh, genuinely several dimensions it's also kind of hard you have to be sure that uh, like they uh, that somehow those compatibility conditions are satisfied. But what is like with relation to our work, what is interesting is to go to uh, saying uh, higher dimensional hyperbolic buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what my speculation, it's maybe not Jan Baxter, but it's the, there are so-called Pentagon equations. Mm. So because the next kind of hyperbolic building, it's uh, when you as a chamber, you can have like a hyperbolic dodecahedra. Do, do yeah, mm -hmm. I would be happy. Where are these pentagon equations are coming from, Alina? Pentagon equations, it's also coming from, from physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, so here we have, um, this kind of, but I think that pentagon, it's, uh, so there are three three elements here, two two elements here, but I even I don't remember what are the upper indices. I think it's just here. You, 
I, I may be wrong because it's like I didn't start to work on this, but I think it's like like equation like this. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, this kind of six terms, one would say, okay, we work with cubes, but uh, in fact, uh, we do work, um, uh, we do have this kind of hexagon mm -hmm. on the cube, right? Because actually what we, what we do, we want to be sure that, uh, so if, if you look at like one diagonal and another, in, in fact, we do have a hexagon, right? So we have this A, A, B, um, A, B, C, and then we have C, B inverse A, so it is a, it is a hexagon. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, I I was quite happy when I almost couldn't believe because usually if you talk to physicists, they like it, it's hard, right? Because it's of course if you try because what what they usually do they try to find such uh, solutions by computer search, and for computer search, right? If you even the the easiest kind of example is already a matrix of of the size three is three hundred twenty four by three hundred twenty four, and of course, if you try to do this by computer search, it can become messy very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you very much. Like many many questions. Okay. I would like to... uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Let's uh, thank Alina. For a very interesting talk, thank you. Okay, so now I think I can st stop the recording.